Hi, welcome to Culturally Determined on Blogging Heads TV. I'm your host, Arya Cohen-Wade, and my guest today is Megan Daum. Uh, Megan, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Megan Daum. I'm a writer, um, author, essayist. I was an opinion columnist at the Los Angeles Times for more than 10 years. Um, and yeah, I have, I have a lot of opinions. <laughs> That's about it. Uh, well, thank you for coming on today. Uh, this is uh, a, a somewhat unusual episode in that we'll be talking about something that involves blogging his TV itself for a little bit. Um, and I also, when I was thinking about emailing you, I thought it was it was almost a little bit like the um, the Bruce Springsteen music video for Dancing in the Dark, where he pulls he pulls uh, Courtney Cox out of the audience onto the stage. Although I am no um, Bruce Springsteen by far, and you are far oh, more well known than short. than you know twenty two year old Courtney Cox. Um, but basically, we're going to be talking about mostly about an essay that you wrote uh, for Medium. Um, the title was "Nuance: A Love Story." And uh, the subhead was, it was something like how I, I want to get it exactly because it was a really good subhead. Um, And the cat is making (laughs) uh, an appearance. Um, My affair with the intellectual dark web. So we'll include a link to this article below. Um, I think it may have gotten a little bit of discussion already on Blogging Heads. I think think Glenn Glenn Lowry and John McWhorter discussed it a little bit. Yes, yes, they did. Um, Right. So, okay, so can you... So it's a, it's a long essay. Um, Medium helpfully yeah. says it's 28 minutes to read. Um, but what is, I guess, why did, you, why did you decide you wanted to write this piece? Well, the piece, um, it was published back in August. And I hadn't originally intended to publish it as a standalone piece. It was actually part of a larger project that I was working on, kind of about the current state of the culture wars and the Trump resistance movement. Um, but then suddenly everybody was talking about the intellectual dark web. Uh, you know, sort of back in the, in the spring, I guess. And I was like, hey, I've been obsessed with this stuff for years already, even before the name Intellectual Dark Web, which is now shortened to IDW, of course, uh, came about. So, so I took the subject matter and framed it around the story um, of the breakup of my marriage and, and the revelation, this, that I, sort of revelation I had that I'd traded the intellectual allyship of my husband for the strange sort of soothing effect of certain public intellectuals on YouTube. And so, so that's how the the piece came about. Um, It was mostly just that everyone was suddenly talking about this and uh, I wanted to, to say my, my piece. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And I want to talk a little bit um, uh, about uh, how you threaded your like personal story and your relationship uh, with your, uh, husband falling apart with the uh, kind of a more analysis of the media trends and what people are talking about. Um, so yeah, probably everyone at this point knows what the intellectual dark web is, but if you don't, um, <laughs> how how blogging heads knows, I'm not sure in the, you'll, you'll be surprised. You go to the parties and they're like, okay. Yes. That that's yeah. So I, I was talking to my wife a night or two ago and I said, I was going to do a blogging episode with a woman about the intellectual dark web. And she hadn't heard of that. Um, Your own wife. My, my very own wife. Um, it speaks well for your marriage. <laughs> You're able to have separation of church and state. Exactly. But how would you describe the intellectual dark web for someone who hasn't heard of it? Um, it's. I guess I would say it's a sort of loose constellation of thinkers, academics, journalists, scientists, uh, scholars. Scholars are academics. Um, that... Uh, sometimes talk to each other, sometimes sort of just talk by themselves um, about issues that, for whatever reason, have been deemed off limits kind of in the more general uh, media. Um, And this is really in response to phenomenon that came about probably around 2015, where for for various reasons... um, I hate to use the term identity politics because it's been so abused, but just let's, you know, for the, 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 the sensibility and the sort of anxieties around identity politics started to be such that there were certain uh, ways of talking about things that were suddenly off limits. And so what emerged were these uh, people like um, Sam Harris and uh, Dave Rubin, who has a very popular show uh, on YouTube, um, some of the, you know, the, the, the new atheists like Sam Harris and then 
some other sort of people who were critical of fourth wave feminism, for instance, uh, kind of talking about all these subjects uh, in ways that you would can really only see uh, in hours long discussions on, on YouTube. And, and the term intellectual dark web uh, was not coined until I want to say 2016, maybe even 2017 by, by Eric Weinstein, who's um, one of these folks. He's a uh, economist and mathematician. Um, and I think that, you know, I, I, it was a pretty off the cuff coinage as far as I observed, but, um, I think it's a little bit of a, of a misdirect. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Eric, so this is no, I'm not throwing any shade on him, but it's been, uh, <laughs> kind of a challenge to live down that, that name. Yeah. You note in the piece, that this kind of silliness of the name and like the dark web was the term used for like, uh, the like encrypted system that drug dealers <laughs> use to didn't even really know about myself. I, the dark web. Yeah. Now it's like, is it, is there like child pornography and things? Yeah. Like I think it's, <laughs> as far as, I mean, I've never been there. I don't know how you get there. I think you need special technical knowledge in order I, to oh, get there. Nobody knows how you get there. Right. If you have to ask. Yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah, I think it's where people, you know, <laughs> trade mostly drugs. That'd be, that'd be my guess. And also probably, uh, you know, guns or other stuff or do other illegal transactions. So, okay. So there's a, um, so this is just like that only intellectual. <laughs> right. Right. So it's people uh, pontificating on the kind of drugs yeah. you buy. No, but I mean, it's, it's interesting that this is like, I, I kind of think that this, so the, the term was applied a couple years ago, but this broke into the mainstream with a piece that Barry Weiss, if I'm pronouncing her name correctly, uh, wrote Barry, for the yeah. New York times, um, opinion section about, uh, over the summer. And, uh, she talked about these people and it caused a, that article caused a big stir. Um, there were a lot of people who were making fun of it. Uh, they did a kind of weird photo thing with it of all the people kind of standing in like darkened nature scenes and looking kind of ominous, like, right. I don't know, like a still from like swamp thing movie or something. <laughs> and, a lot of mossy, a lot of moss, a lot of shadows. Yeah. So it's like, okay, here, so here's like the people, they can only operate at night, <laughs> you know, the, the dark web. Right. Uh, but they have like a, a secret, tr like secret truth that they reveal to you, um, and then yeah, I think it's it's really one of the um, if we think about like the brands that hit the scene in 2018, it's one of the top top ones I would say. And more people, maybe uh, people who are checked out from politics haven't heard of, heard of it, but um, if you pay attention to politics online, you've probably heard of, heard of it at this point. Okay, so what what attracted you to these people before they congealed into the intellectual dark web? Oh my gosh, well, what a great setup. So my gateway into the intellectual dark web uh, was was blogging heads, was uh, John, uh, the Glenn Show, Glenn Lowry and John McWhorter, who called themselves the black guys on blogging heads. And, you know, they've been doing these these conversations for, well, you would know better than I, I mean, like several years. Maybe yeah, it, before, it started before the 2008 election because yes, originally right. John was for Obama and Glenn was for Hillary. And that was okay. that was one of their original uh, splits <laughs> to debate over. Okay. Right. Wow. That sounds so quaint now. <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, Glowry and McWhorter get together about once a month and they have this free ranging conversation about all sorts of things. But, um, you know, they focus a lot on on issues around race. And. I just, I, I, I thought then, and I continue to think that this is just the best show in town. I mean, these guys are so candid and, you know, nuanced. There's another word that's about careening into overuse, but um, it's an important word. Uh, they, they just have a way of, of talking about things really honestly and really thoughtfully and with a great deal of generosity to, to each other. Uh, and, and I just, I, I found them mesmerizing and, and they were just, you know, I, I think the thing with a lot of these conversations, particularly them, they, they, you know, you wonder why everybody's like watching people talk to each other on YouTube. And I just think it's like, it, it, it's the thing that most closely resembles private conversations. I mean, it kind of, the, we now have this divide between the way people talk in public uh, and the way people talk in private and the private conversations are usually so much more interesting because they're so much more honest. 
Um, and that's not to say that somehow people are like uh, unleashing their their most bigoted, uh, e- evil, uh, r- racist thoughts. Not at all. I just think that they are free to kind of uh, think like thinkers and and ruminate and um, take their time with with ideas, which we we're just there's no the that's just not available, you know, on on CNN and, and even on the op-ed pages. Um, and so, so we're really finding in here. So yeah, so Je- Glenn and John were, were, um, my, uh, my portal into this. And then of course the YouTube algorithms, you know, took me down the rabbit hole from there. Right. And I want to talk about that. That's, uh, that's oh, like also a huge theme of this year is like how people start in one place on YouTube and, and somewhere else. Uh, right. but just, uh, uh, for, you know, the sake of, uh, professional vanity, I suppose just, you know, a little bit more on, on blogging heads. Um, I think, you know, well, we'll, we'll hear something. Um, you know, we've had, uh, Brett, um, Weinstein on, uh, at least three times, I think, uh, he was on with Glenn. He was on with, uh, Bob Wright. Um, at one point, you know, Bob asked him, I think it was Bob, what do you, um, you know, how would you describe the intellectual dark web? And he said something like, you know, it's a place for people who don't agree with each other to come together and, you know, have conversations uh, with each other. And I was like, well, that's Blogging Heads TV. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. I mean, blo- you know, Blogging Heads was founded in 2005. Uh, Robert Wright and Mickey Kaus founded it. Um, you know, they were at the time <laughs> both Democrats who, uh, but they disagreed about a lot of things and they had a generally civil, although since they, they're longtime friends, it was also kind of a mocking conversation with each other. And then it expanded to be often a right left conversation that was, you know, at least half an hour long and different than the kind of thing you would get on, uh, cable news or most other outlets, um, in the world and 2005 was also the year that YouTube started. Uh, the blogging heads platform was in a sense, uh, a pioneer in, in online video, but, uh, the YouTube platform certainly won in the end because, uh, it was, um, you know, you could upload whatever you wanted and it was a platform, not a like content provider. So, a couple of years ago, Blogging Heads moved its stuff. So Blogging Heads hosted its own video originally, and then a couple of years, Blogging Heads, years ago, Blogging Heads moved its stuff to YouTube. So now, if you go to watch Blogging Heads on YouTube, you get a, um, you know, on the on the side, you get like ten or so recommendations that the algorithm thinks you'll like. Uh, some of them are just other Blogging Heads videos, uh, possibly featuring the same people, and the other ones are decided by the mysterious uh, algorithm. Um, but I guess like. You know, what is, so I, I was, I was thinking like, you know, everyone's, everyone's talking about the IDW this year, you know, blogging has been around for a while and it's remained a niche product. Like, you know, blogging has not count, conquered the world. And do you have any idea why, what is it? Is it timing? Is it content? Is it technology? Do you have any thoughts why uh, this took off now? Whereas a kind of similar product that was available for the past 13 years, like, Mm. did not did not launch into the stratosphere and have a uh, you know patreon with <laughs> with getting in a hundred thousand dollars a year as uh Drew Peterson seems to yeah I don't oh, i've never I've never thought about that I mean I guess I would have to assume it's just because like I said people are so tired of media experiences where people are just saying the wrote predictable thing. I, I just, I, it's almost like it's reached a saturation point. I mean, people have been complaining about the 24 hour news cycle for, I don't know, 20 years now. Mm-hmm. Um, that's nothing new. Um, and you know, social media is not really new anymore either, but I don't know. I think there's something, I mean, it was, I guess in the, in the wake of the last election and the rise of Trump and the, just the, 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 the out the the way that signaling takes place um the way that that you know we've just sort of there's there's a way of registering opinion often outrage uh on social media and even in on cable news whatever it is that i just think it's become it's almost like everybody has their has their brand it's so predictable like you know there there are writers that i 
that I greatly <laughs> admire on in various publications, and and I go to them and I and I read them, but I also know I'm, what I'm going to get. It's the stop I make when I want to read uh, somebody talking about you know immigration and you know in a certain way this is the this is the far left stop I want to make here this is the centrist stop I want to make um and so I guess like I, I guess blogging heads it's always just there's been this kind of element of surprise I mean I don't want to say shooting from the hip because that sounds a little dismissive but I mean I don't know <laughs> maybe the fact that that you know there are so many people's pets making appearances all the time <laughs> on the show I mean it might be just sort of the ultimate metaphor for the the impromptu nature of, of the discussions, you know, like the animals do have a way of making appearances, like almost <laughs> disproportionate to other kinds of video chat platforms. Yeah. So, so Dave Rubin has this set where he is, his, uh, his guests and him are sitting in these, you know, kind of modernist <laughs> chairs. Uh, I have my office chair here <laughs> and a cat who's sticking her butt <laughs> on the screen right now. Um, yeah. So that's one difference. Um, but Ruben is kind of, he's like the only one who has, well, I guess Rogan has a, has this setup as well. Uh, but I guess, you know, Ben Shapiro kind of has this production company as well. But did they think we're, well, actually, let me ask you this, Arie, are people, are most people watching blogging heads or are they actually listening to it? Cause I always watch. So I might, I there's might not have a normal experience. Yeah. There's a split. It, it was, you know, for almost, I think from the very beginning, there was a podcast option kind of before people were talking about podcasts. Um, I think. Uh, just in the past couple of years, especially since after Serial came out, which I think was 2015, like more and more people who had never listened to a podcast before started getting into it. And now there's like podcast empires like Pod Save America or whatever they're called and, all, you know, a couple other ones. Um, so there's so there's that. And that actually is a growing part of the audience. And then there's the, the YouTube. Um, there's people who come to the site as it is and look at the homepage. Uh, that's probably fewer people than you know, five years ago where more people are just using social media now and then not like going to different homepages. And then the, there's like the YouTube people. Um, and yeah, it's, I think it's definitely different audiences. It's harder to know with the podcast because there's no like comment section or shareability exactly with podcasts. Whereas YouTube, you get to see the comments. Um, and yeah. And then like, I think also the recommendation algorithm is definitely different because everyone has a different uh, podcast app. Um, and whereas YouTube is just the one platform. Um, so it's definitely, yeah, so there's, there's a split. Um, and I, yeah, I, I usually listen, I usually listen to them. Um, even though I work here, uh, I, you know, find it boring to stare, stare at people's faces. Oh. I, would, I would rather listen to it while I'm doing a chore or driving or something. Uh, that's my preferred podcast, uh, my preferred way of absorbing this stuff at this point. Um, but yeah, so that's, yeah, so that's different as well. I, so I guess, um, yeah, okay, so once you, so you're watching Glenn Larry, and then you see a column on the side of your YouTube browser, and it says something like, uh, you know, well, what, what, what's, what's the title? What's the kind of a Lauren title? I know you mentioned a couple in the piece that, uh, that would grab your eye and make you click on it. Oh, I mean, well, there's the, like, clickbait incendiary, you know, I mean, it, I, I guess, you know, once Jordan Peterson showed up in the mix, it was like, you know... Jordan Peterson owns SJW Snowflake. Yeah, there's a lot of those for Ben Shapiro as well. Ben Shapiro destroys right. campus, whatever. Yeah, well, so, you know, I was um, around 2015. I, you know, I was writing a lot. I have over the years wrote a lot about uh, feminism and its various iterations. And um, I long consider myself not only a liberal, but a feminist. I, I have never disavowed that label and I don't think I ever will but um, I've always uh, been critical or uh, certainly questioning of certain uh, certain optics uh, in in the feminist movement and um, you know as 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 feminism became more uh, enmeshed with social media uh, I, I just got sort of increasingly frustrated with a lot of the kind of hashtagging and, you know, what, what is now often called uh, ironic misandry, the kill all men memes, I, I bathe in male tears, whatever it is. Um, mm -hmm. I was really interested in the case of Emma Solkowitz, who was the Columbia student who was carrying her mattress around in uh, 2014, 2015, when this school um, had decided not to expel 
um, a fellow student that she had said sexually assaulted her. So she was carrying her mattress around and this became, you know, an international news story. And she became the symbol for um, the the discussions about sexual assault on, on campus. And, and I was I was really interested in that. And I, and I was interested in it as a as a Gen Xer, really, because I remember, you know, the <laughs> version 1.0 of this discussion back from the from the early 90s. So mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, this is a very long-winded answer to, to your question. I, I was really, I was, I was following a lot of stuff uh, around w- women's issues, and so probably uh, when I would watch the black guys on blogging heads, like Christina Hoff Summers would would pop up in the corner or something like that. Um, her discussions with Camille Paglia, um, I just found like incredibly entertaining. Um, I don't agree with uh, either of them um, on every point, certainly, but um, the, the two of them were just like so dissonant. I mean, you couldn't <laughs> you couldn't imagine sort of uh, two people whose sensibilities you would think were, were more misaligned on the surface, but it actually resulted in kind of um, amazing discussion. So, you know, I would watch that kind of thing and that would, pro- I don't know, probably eventually that led me to, to the Rubin Report. Um, and then when Brett Weinstein showed up, uh, I guess that was 2017, right? Um, you know, I think that's right. He, you know, went into the world of Weinstein. Right. Okay. So let's let's talk about the Rubin Report a little bit because I probably people who don't look at YouTube uh, have never heard of this guy because um, he doesn't have like a real profile outside of like this the space. Um, and I, I don't know a ton about him either. So I, I, he is a either a stand-up comedian or a former stand-up comedian. Is that is that correct? Um, I, I mean, he's is I don't know. He's opening for Jordan Peterson on the road, so I don't know if he's doing stand-up. I, I would not call him a former stand-up. I actually um, I had to make a correction. I had at one point referred to Joe Rogan as a former stand-up, and that's not correct. He is. He is an active stand-up, so I don't want to make the same mistake with with Dave Rubin. Once a stand-up, always a stand-up, maybe. So let's right. Just so, say. so Rogan was, you know, had a yeah. public profile. He was on news radio. He was on the band show, right. um, and uh, and uh, parlayed that into a, a very popular podcast. But Rubin was not uh, like you know, kind of came out of he was he wasn't a popular stand-up comedian. Well, Rogan. he was on the Young Turks. I mean, he was okay. sort of. He was a big, right, so he got kind of, I don't want to say radicalized, but he started to question the progressive narrative um, at some point uh, during his stint on on the Young Turks, which is a very, uh, you know, sort of left-leading progressive YouTube show. Uh, And I, I, yeah, I don't remember exactly what he was doing there, but I think that kind of marked his, the beginning of his independence. And he, at some point, started his own show. Right, um, and so, yeah, so he's the one who has this uh, set where he's they're sitting in these in this like yes. well appointed living room kind of it's place. Like a, by YouTube standards, it's very high production value. <laughs> right, yeah. right, yeah. So it's it may, it may just be in someone's garage or something, but it, it looks it's in his garage <laughs> in the in the spirit of Mark Marin. Yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So I, okay. So here is my impression of him, and you can tell me what's wrong about it. Um, I'm gonna do- Impression? No, not do an impression. My impression of him as a public figure. All right. Um, he is a. He says he, he was a liberal. I know he's he's gay. Um, he moved. Something set him off. Maybe about SJWs, social justice warriors, or the campus left. Something set him off, and then like I don't know if he would call say he himself was red pilled, but like he mo- made that kind of move that like that refers to like more towards the right, and then he. Toward the center, toward the center, maybe we should say. But, okay, so okay. then he has okay. a show, and basically the only people he invites on are uh, conservatives or critics of liberalism or the left, and then they basically like agree with each other for okay for ninety okay. minutes. So is it, this is before my time with him? So I'll defer to you. Okay, okay so yeah. is this is this right or wrong that it's it's very it's like he pretty much just the the guests are Peterson Shapiro, uh, Brett Weinstein, and his wife. Um, uh, Coleman Hughes, someone who appeared on the Glenn Larry show a couple months months ago. Mm-hmm. People, it, it's a lot of people who like either are on the right or like started on the left and then became critics of the left. Um, yeah, that's probably true. Thomas Sewell has been on a couple times. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess the question is, I, but I, 
Yeah, I'm trying to think like who would go on. I mean, but then this kind of gets into a larger discussion. Like, is there such a stigma to going on a show like that, that, you know, any sort of self-respecting, uh, you know, member of the left-leaning uh, mainstream uh, cognoscenti would would be wary. I, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I guess, you know, I, I think that the, the Rubin Report shows that initially attracted me, uh, I guess it was, you know, it was the Brett and Eric Weinstein appearance. Like, I think Brett went on by himself initially because of, of the scandal at Evergreen State College that that brought him into the into the spotlight. Um, yeah. But, you know, the thing about the thing about the Rubin report and I think with all these things, the people, they just talk for so long. You know, it's funny. I used to I used to say about Terry Gross, you know, for years. I mean, she's she's a fantastic interviewer, but I always thought what people, you know, it's I, I, I'm not sure it's like she had, you know, some sort of magic trick. It's just that she happened to have really great guests. She could book great people. And they talked for a really long time, mm -hmm. like by the standards, by any standards of, you know, kind of major media, talking to somebody for 40 minutes is incredibly long. And so there always felt there was something very luxurious about the, the fresh air interview. And it was kind of a gold standard in interviewing. So and, but now we have people on on Rogan talking for like three hours and 40 minutes or something. And um, I, I guess I guess people like that. Uh, you know, I, I certainly do if it's the right guest. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a, there's definitely an audience for it, and you know, at blogging has usually we stuck to like an hour or so, um, yeah. and and that was kind of like, well, that's as long as a TV show is, and you know, people have to get along with their day. Um, but then, <laughs> yeah, YouTube showed that there's an audience for people listening to two and a half hour conversations. Um, I don't know if we could go that if we'd ever go that long on blogging heads, but we have thought about like you know maybe going like not saying like ninety minutes would be more more the uh, standard or not. But yeah, so okay, um, so who? So yeah, so who do you think are these people <laughs> who have three and a half hours to watch a Joe Rogan episode or a Dave Rubin <laughs> episode? Well, I mean, I would. Uh, I, I can only speak for myself. I mean, I, I work from home. I'm, I'm a freelance writer. I don't go into an office. Um, I live by myself. And so, and I actually don't watch TV. I, 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 you know, I watch TV the way most people do. I kind of binge watch and I watch the streaming, you know, cable, cable streaming. And, um, it's not like I, you know, have dinner and then sit on the couch and turn on NBC. Um, so, but what I found myself doing is like, I would eat dinner <laughs> in front of the computer and, uh, and watch these people talking to each other. And, you know, I mean, getting back to the piece, I mean, you know, the, the piece is really, you know, I wanted to talk about this phenomenon, but I also really was sending myself up in a lot of ways. I mean, it's I, I joke that, you know, it, you know, when I when I was married, like a lot of couples, you know, we spent a lot of time watching uh, cable high end uh, cable shows like that was, you know, we didn't have kids, but, you know, we would sit down and we would watch, you know, two or three hours of Breaking Bad uh, mm -hmm. every evening and, and then sort of spend, you know, the rest of the night or the following day talking about it. Uh, and so when my marriage broke up and I was living by myself, there was something a little bit sad about about watching uh, like cable TV, you know, dramas by myself. It, it was kind of like cooking for myself. I mean, maybe if I had been more, more maybe I was a more psychologically healthy person. I, <laughs> I would, I would cook for myself and like, you know, watch, uh, you know, Berlin station myself. <laughs> but, uh, it, you know, I may, maybe, I think perhaps watching, uh, intellectual dark web people talk to each other on YouTube is like the, uh, the, this mental equivalent of eating while standing over the sink, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just something you do when no one's looking. <laughs> Okay. You can't get out of the habit. Yeah. Yeah. So again, that's another like resonance with like dark, like you, you know, you watch it, <laughs> you watch these things in the dark. So okay, there's a couple times in the essay, you refer to them, uh, the people appearing on your screen as your friends or your new friends, uh, mm -hmm. which I thought was funny. And um, can you talk about that aspect of it? Like, because it is okay. So if you're like watching Brett Weinstein, 
and Dave Rubin talk to each other as opposed to watching like Don Draper talk to Betty Draper, then like, <laughs> like, okay, those like two of them are real people and two of them are actors, <laughs> you know? So there's, there's a sense that, well, maybe you could be friends with Brett Weinstein. You could, you know, meet him somewhere like after, you know, one of his speaking ga- engagements. So it, it is like a different relationship for like, nor- like more or less normal people, not super yeah. celebrities are like being, you know, beamed directly at your face. Yeah, I mean, I think what it was, I'm not somebody who like uh, goes up and gets my books signed by authors after readings or that sort of thing. I'm, I'm kind of shy. I mean, yes, I, I know I joked in the piece that, you know, that I went up to John McWhorter and kind of fangirled all over him after he did an event at Columbia. And it was it was like I think I joked that it was like, you know, meeting Bruce Springsteen. Um, but. I I think more what was happening, and I think this happens for a lot of people who get into this stuff, because believe me, I hear from them. After I published that piece, I just heard from hundreds and hundreds of people who were like also into this. You know, I think what happened for some people who always identified as liberal, um, thought of themselves as on the right side of things, loved Obama, um, were sort of adequately excited about Hillary Clinton or maybe very excited about Bernie Sanders, whatever. Um, You know, starting around 2015, and obviously that's before people really started talking about Bernie Sanders, um, there was a divide between, um, you know, me and some of my friends who were just so... um, such dyed in the wool lefties that they didn't always seem willing to look at certain uh, things happening in the culture in, in an honest way. I mean, I was noticing I was noticing that a lot of private conversations um, were much um, were were much more interesting. Like I said, and and people were able to kind of say, "Yeah, I don't I I I." I acknowledge that there is sexual assault on campus, and I acknowledge that we need to do something about this and that it's hard for women and that there are gender uh, dynamics that are not safe for people in various ways. Okay. I acknowledge that, but at the same time, I'm not sure what I think about this idea that women are unsafe on mass. I'm not sure how I feel about this kind of um, assumption that, that women don't have agency. I feel infantilized by a lot of the discussion around around misogyny and female vulnerability. Okay, so like these conversations would be happening kind of in private. And then some of these same people would then go and on Twitter and say like the complete opposite. Um, And sometimes these were like other journalists. They were some people who were just kind of speaking publicly, whether it be on Facebook or on Twitter, um, you know, regardless of the size of, of their audience. Um, and I found this really frustrating and it made me feel a kind of distance from a lot of my friends to be, to be quite honest. I, I, you know, and in some cases we flat out disagreed. I mean, there were some cases where people just said, Megan, you're a rape apologist. The fact that you're even asking these questions, I, it, it alarms me. I, I, I can't be around you. And it wasn't like that was a huge amount of people, but it did happen. And so I think, you know, to the extent that I felt like, people like Brett Weinstein and Heather, Heather Hying, who's Brett Weinstein's wife, also an evolutionary biologist, to the extent that I thought they were my friends or that John McWhorter was my friend. Um, it, it really, it wasn't that I wanted to meet them and hang out with them. It's that they made me feel less alone. I, I felt that they were having a similar cognitive dissonance. Um, and, and that's really what it was about. I mean, I think that the kind of key here and what really interests me more than anything um, I, I, I want to live in a world where people are allowed to be conflicted. And, and I feel like, uh, a lot of the discussion on the big platforms, there's really no room for that. It's like, you're either all on this side or all on the other side. And if you dare deviate or ask a question or register any kind of ambivalence, ooh, you, that's, that's not a, you know, you've, you, you're potentially causing harm. And, uh, and, and that's the kind of thing that I, that I was, I gravitated towards these discussions because I felt like other people were feeling similarly conflicted. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. There's a, there's a lot there. Um, so I think, yeah. So like, I would say it's, it's so weird and such a like, like (laughs) 
historical accident and historical shame that like Twitter is the place where so many of these like debates are happening when Twitter is like either through design or just accident is like impossible to <laughs> express like, yeah, well, it, you know, so yeah. a year ago it was 140 characters. Like you can't express a nuanced statement, in 140 characters. They doubled that, but still it's pretty, it's, it's pretty hard to express a nuanced statement there. Um, it's, it's like the p- platform uh, promotes tribalism, like above all, like in political tribalism, but also like in any sphere, like, you know, there's tribalism about whether or not the um, last Star Wars movie was good, and people end up getting death threats because they're arguing so much about whether this movie was good or bad. And it just, and, you know, sports stuff, whatever it is, like Twitter just <laughs> encourages people to uh, gravitate to a side and then, like, reinforce extreme voices. And uh, yeah, and it uh, really sucks. <laughs> and uh, our our president is, uh, you know, one of the main culprits of, of this, and he took advantage of it, and um, he's made it worse. Um, I think, you know, there's something, like, you know, so some of these people, like, had no public platform, really, before, um, before gaining, like, YouTube fame. Like, Jordan Peterson was a uh, professor, so, you know, he had, like, a, a status position, but the average person had no idea who he was. Um, you know, Rogan was like a comedian who people hadn't thought about in 10 or 15 years. Um, and then they're able to use, um, the YouTube platform, you know, which I think like YouTube is a social network, even though people don't think of it, uh, that way primarily, but it is like, it is a social network and a lot of especially young people use it that way. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, they were able to use this different technology to, like assemble people who are who are like minded, um, and maybe they're just like minded in the sense that they want to hear different views, um, as it sounds like you are, or maybe they're like minded and they feel that like uh, campus SJWs are the biggest threat to uh, freedom in America right now, um, <laughs> and they can find a, find a person like Ben Shapiro or something who's gonna you know agree with them about that. Uh, but there's but there also is something about like the like YouTube platform, like you know I'm just sitting in my house and I'm talking and I'm talking to you in this case, but uh, sometimes like people make uh, YouTube videos. That's just them speaking to the camera for an hour, you know, and in a, like a monologue or a diatribe or something. <laughs> and it does seem like they're talking to you more, much more so than uh, the traditional uh, forms of uh, like, you know, public communication that, that we well, used to have. Well, they're not being interrupted. I mean, the whole discourse is really rooted in interruption, is it not? So if you've got someone just talking to the camera, I guess you'd be surprised how how seductive that can be, you know? Right. And, um, you know, okay, well, here's, I've actually, I actually had a guy on uh, my show last week um, who has a, uh, he calls himself a member of the dissident right, and uh, he you know, is a conser- conservative. He's not an alt-right person, but he uh, is very critical of basically everything the GOP has done. He has a YouTube channel. Uh, he has a podcast. He, um, I-, I put the question to him, why, why is like, why has YouTube become the preferred platform for conservatives and not liberals or leftists? Mm. Do, you, do you have any thoughts on that? Oh gosh, I thought you were going to tell me what he said. <laughs> uh... I don't know. The glib, the glib answer is that you don't have to read. I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, okay. So he had a couple of theories. Um, one of them had to do with um, video games and oh. you, an early use of YouTube was to show video game clips and talk about video games. And then there was uh, this Gamergate thing that everyone remembers and that like radicalized people who weren't politically um, interested at all, you know, like a 17 year old guy who just liked video games. And then they like moved into like a Milo Yiannopoulos or Ben Shapiro video and on and on. Um, there's a couple theories that actually I first heard on Chapo Trap House when they were interviewing uh, ContraPoints, who's a left-wing YouTuber personality. And um, she said, or I think actually it was one of the hosts saying that, um, you know, it, in some ways it's similar to talk radio and talk radio mm-hmm. thrived as a conservative medium for a number of years and uh, it's that that was almost always just a guy, like a guy, a man with a deep voice talking for hours and hours about things that, um, you know, might make someone angry. And uh, that's just moved onto onto YouTube. And then there, he actually they also talked about this kind of like friend thing of if there's people out there who are, you know, who are isolated and then they can watch what more or less like what you were saying. They can watch someone talk to them for an hour 
um, it, it it's not a, a human to human conversation, but it's like the, the next best thing. And he, according to him, um, you know, more of these people might be, you know, uh, some unemployed guy in the Midwest or something who um, right. can't get a girl and uh, has no life prospects. And then he uh, becomes a big fan of, you know, whoever the right wing people are on, on YouTube. <laughs> Does any of that <laughs> ring true? I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't I don't tend to watch that sort of stuff. And I don't. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to I. I mean, the, the talk radio analogy is interesting because, you know, I, I've always been struck by, you know, I think there have been studies that talk radio really started to take off when people moved further out into the suburbs. You know, the emergence of the exurbs, people's commute times became longer and longer. So you had people driving, you know, an hour, two hours, sometimes more each way to work. And so, you know, Rush Limbaugh really came out of just people being captive audiences in mm -hmm. their cars. Um, so I don't know if there, I, you know, I, this is the kind of thing, I, I wonder if there's some sort of analogous phenomenon where people are telecommuting or working from home. I mean, you know, you don't have to, there's the whole economy now that you, you don't really have to leave your house. Right, or, uh, or like, a, you know, like the young person who, you know, graduated from college and can't get a job and still lives with their parents. Um, right. You know, that type, right. that type of person who would be more, right. it wasn't commuting and is more like isolated and watch YouTube videos for a long time. Yeah. But you know, I wonder, you know, the people, and again, I'm just thinking out loud here. This isn't something I've thought a lot about. Like the people who come to say a Jordan Peterson event, you know, you know, fill, fill those theaters who buy those tickets. Are those the same people who are sitting in their basements watching YouTube? I, I would be inclined to think not. I mean, those are people who live in in major cities or who can get to major cities who can afford tickets uh who are going out um so it might uh, you know I, again i just think that these are such big audiences that it's hard to to generalize i mean i, I actually think more you know the for me the roots of these sorts of conversations um, it's not from, from right wing radio. It's almost, <laughs> you're going to laugh. I mean, I was, a, I have been a long time Howard Stern fan. I was a huge fan of Howard Stern, like, you know, as early as I can remember. I mean, uh -huh. I remember listening to him, hearing him on the radio, catching him when I was like, you know, in seventh grade or something. And he was interviewing somebody and I thought, who is this guy? I had never heard somebody with speech and diction like this on the radio. He was so casual. There was something, it was almost like watching a cinema verite. Like there was a sort of auditory, uh, it, it, it felt like an audio version of, of watching a, a documentary film or something. Just the, the, the looseness and the conversational, um, just, just the, the, the entire sort of aesthetic of, of his voice and his, his presentation was so new. And, um, you know, in fact, Ira Glass has talked about this. I mean, Ira Glass's, you know, radio technique and approach is, is really heavily influenced by Howard Stern. Hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, this is something that he's talked about. Um, and Howard Stern is a fantastic interviewer, always has been. Those interviews go on for long, long periods of time. They're rambling. He makes, he, you know, he kind of, people finally let their guard down. Um, and so I think between Howard Stern and, and you're going to laugh, um, the, other, <laughs> the other show I loved in my early 20s and beyond was, was Dr. Drew and Adam Carolla. Mm -hmm. I mean, I actually joked, I sent a tweet a while back. I said, you know, it, Adam and Dr. Drew were the original intellectual dark web. The stuff that they talked about on Loveline, I mean, I don't know, maybe you're too young, but Loveline was this call-in show about sex and relationships. Yeah, it was around when I was a teen, but I, I never oh. I never listened to it because I it came on late, right? I used to watch Letterman and Conan. I, I didn't listen to Loveline. I didn't have a love life, so I wasn't listening to Loveline. Well, neither did the people who called in often. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, people who call in and ask questions about relationships, about uh, substance use and abuse, about sex sometimes about politics, about culture, and they would just answer in such a candid um, and often incredibly wise way. I mean, Adam Carolla is, is almost like a savant in some ways. He is incredibly intuitive and insightful um, about human behavior. And I, I, I have to say that that kind of conversation 
uh, really went away for a long time. I mean, the stuff that they would talk about and joke about and, and the way that the callers just rolled with the punches and really accepted um, a, a, a line of inquiry and a, a, a sort of sense of humor that was, I mean, it would have been, cons- it would definitely be considered politically incorrect now, but it was very, it was very unapologetic, but it really just kind of, it, because of that lack of apology, it was so deeply respectful to all involved. It just assumed everyone was on the same level. Everyone had a sense of humor. Everyone was listening or had called in because they were on the same page about wanting to hear honest, uh, good humored, uh, often counterintuitive answers to their questions. And, and that I really think went away for several years and it, it resurfaced in the form of some of these discussions. I mean, by the way, Adam and Dr. Drew do have a podcast. They, uh, it's, it, it's a pretty short, it's like 20 to 30 minutes and it's oh. on several times a week. So <laughs> maybe the algorithm will, will point people toward that. But, <laughs> uh, but anyway, I, that, I, I was really much more interested in that kind of discourse um, than in anything like Rush Limbaugh. I'm not interested in Rush Limbaugh. He's boring to me. Um, so, so the stuff I was going after uh, and gravitating toward really came from like, a Howard Stern place. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So talking, I mean, mentioning Stern as, <laughs> as a kid, my, my parents listened to Imus. Uh, we didn't listen to mm-hmm. we didn't, in the car when I was being driven to school. Um, I didn't listen to uh, Stern. And, and so I had kind of like a, uh, uh, you know, when I was like 11 years old, I had like a anti Stern animus because I thought like, Oh, Stern. Well, Imus, like, yeah. You can't, you got to pick a side. Yeah. You know, Stern is just like farting, Where farting into the microphone like the or something. Max or the, VHS. Yeah. Um, We're really dating ourselves, but I'm <laughs> dating myself much worse than you are. <laughs> um, but Stern, so, okay, maybe, you know, history has forgotten that Stern did long, you know, thoughtful interviews, but a lot of what he did was kind of just like outrageous stuff. Right. The thing I remember was like a, a girl in a bikini sitting on the speaker and then playing sound and her like pretending she was getting it. But that was so brilliant. The idea of having strippers on the radio. I mean, (laughs) how like meta is that? That's like a, you know, PhD level, uh, (laughs) kind of sociology dissertation. Okay. So, so it, okay. Well, it, it was definitely like lowbrow. You, you, you claim there's a secret highbrowism to it. I can't evaluate for myself, but I'm thinking like, where did that kind of anarchic spirit go? Um, in some, and also thinking about the sort of censorious, moralistic nature of the contemporary left that like drove you away. I think like if you follow any leftist people, not liberals, but leftists on Twitter or ever listen to Chapo Trap House, like that anarchic, like fuck everyone (laughs) spirit definitely lives on. And they say plenty of stuff that, um, you know, you wouldn't be able to air on, uh, the CBS evening news or whatever. So that's, mm-hmm. that's still there. But then I think like the spirit of like trans transgression, you know, if you set a rule, uh, there's going to be some person out there who wants to transgress that rule and enjoy doing that. I think that's a core part of being a human. And then, you know, the, the social just- justice warrior type has been setting a lot of rules in the past five to 10 years. And so there's people who are like, you know, fuck your rules. Uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to call you uh, they or whatever, you know? Um, so there's, I think a spirit of that is alive with some of the people on the IDW who are like, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to play by your rules and because your rules are full of shit. Right. And the people who, I'm most drawn to on the IDW are the people who are saying that not just to be contrarian, but because they actually want to want to get at something. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm a, I'm an essayist, like I'm an, I'm an opinion columnist. I'm somebody who has spent my whole career trying to metabolize what's out in the world and in the culture and, and put it in writing and, and kind of try to home in on the things that people are thinking about, but maybe are afraid to articulate or don't know how to express or whatever it is. And, you know, I I guess I come at this as I'm not an expert in any of these things that anybody talks about. I mean, if you want to, you know, they're out there talking about why aren't there more women in STEM fields? Why is there a gender wage gap? Is it a patriarchal conspiracy? Is it a result of choices that women make? Is it some combination of both? 
are there sex differences in, in you know, between male and female? Are, are there differences between male and female brains? I don't really, I don't know the answers to any of those things. Uh, but I want to live in a world where people who do have the answers or have their version of the answer or think they have the answer can, can talk about it. I, I, I really, I, I'm not, I, I, you know, people say like, oh, well, you know, you must have, you, you've become a conservative or something like this, or you think this, I don't, I often just, I don't know what I think, but I want to, I want to be able to ask and I want to be able to find out. And mm -hmm. so I, that's what really, I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm less interested in somebody like Ben Shapiro than I am in somebody like, for instance, like Brett Weinstein and Heather Hine, because they, they talk about, uh, biology and these questions, um, you know, in terms of facts, I mean, they are able to say just because something, uh, you know, just because there's something in nature that we don't like, uh, doesn't mean it's not true. <laughs> and, and that doesn't seem like, uh, uh, that should not be a, such a radical thing to say, but for some reason it has been. And just as a, as a writer and as a thinker, it really scares me to think that we've come to a place where we can't even have these conversations. Mm -hmm. um, do you understand why Ben Shapiro is grouped in with these other people? Because I, I don't really get it. I, you know, I, I need, I don't actually, I haven't spent enough time uh, in his virtual presence to <laughs> probably speak to that. I, I, I've, I just, I've never been a big fan. Um, you know, my understanding is that he is capable of, of being really thoughtful and, and it could make, useful contributions to the discussion if, if, but he still has like, you know, the, you know, own the libs coffee mug or, or whatever it is. And I just, the liberal, that kind liberal of thing is, yes, liberal. I, I just, I don't know. I don't, I, I, it's unfortunate. You know, I think there's, uh, yeah. Why is he included? I don't know. You'll have to ask, uh, Dave Rubin, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, I will. I mean, part of the reason Dave Rubin might want him to have on it, might want to have him on is that he has a big following. So yeah, he's he gets, huge following. So he yes. gets more, you know, 10 times as many page views or whatever when he comes on. Yeah, yeah. to me, Shapiro is just a down the line conservative. He worked at Breitbart, um, but he uh, did something admirable, which was he opposed Donald Trump and he quit uh, Breitbart. Right. Um, you know, he, he resigned. I can't remember if he resigned because of that thing where um, Corey Lewandowski grabbed. Uh, you know, the arm of a woman who was a oh, Breitbart yes. reporter and kind of shoved her. And then they, that's what it took. Yes. Yeah. I th okay. So yeah, I think that was the, the incident that drove. I don't know. Breitbart. I don't know, but yeah. But other than that, he's just a conservative. So if, if this group that's like, you know, contesting things, I, I don't quite get it, but um, okay. So <laughs> let's talk about Jordan Peterson <laughs> for just uh, at least a moment. Um, I, um, I have never gotten so much negative blowback in, all, the three years I've been doing this podcast as when I said negative things about Jordan Peterson. Um, <laughs> like, you know, I've done, I've done like a hundred different topics and that's the one that has gotten people the most angry. Um, yeah. And you, in, you have kind of a, like, I thought in the essay, kind of like a sense of resignation about like where he like, div like moved towards in his evolution or that he became too famous too soon or something along those lines. Like what, what, what do you think about him? I so I, I really have to be careful about talking about him. He he contains multitudes to such a degree that it's almost impossible. He can't contain himself, and any discussion about him cannot be contained. Uh, he's doing so many things at once. Uh, I think that a lot of what he has to say is valuable. Um, I think that he gets in his own way a lot. I think that, you know, I, I, I get, you know, when you are, when you do have that sort of platform and you're speaking to that many people, I do think you have a responsibility as a public person to make your message clear, to try to avoid being misinterpreted. Obviously it's not totally avoidable and anything sort of worth saying is going to probably be misinterpreted by considerable number of people, but he, he, uh, he almost seems willfully, uh, <laughs> willfully uh, uninterested in, in, in being, being clear. I mean, I, I, it's, it's unfortunate that, that he rose to prominence over that bill that, you know, that the, the trans, you know, he didn't, the trans issue, you know, there was a piece of Canadian legislation. I guess this was in like 
toward the sometime in 2015, maybe maybe 2016, uh, and he it was compelled speech legislation, and he started. You know, he was just a random. He was a professor, as you said. He wasn't that well known, but he started making a fuss because he didn't want to be compelled by law to use certain pronouns. Uh, and he said, well, you know, if somebody wants me to use certain pronouns, I will oblige, I will respect them, I will use them, but I just don't want to be told uh, by the government that I have to use these pronouns. And, you know, that, of course, those little videos went viral. And that was, you know, his, his introduction to the public was owning the libs in that particular way. And it just seemed to me a really kind of pointless hill to die on because he's he's got a lot more going on than just that but I think that really just kind of set the stage for him kind of tonally uh and he hasn't been able to live that down and I'm not sure he really wants to yeah um he is he strikes me as a um unusual person for sure uh definitely like a very like he stands by his principles um and maybe we'll like you know ride his principles all the way down but you know all the way down to where the <laughs> like it's working out for him he's on a mm-hmm. you know, he's, he's soon to embark on a european tour um so there's definitely an audience interested in um the message he's <laughs> giving i think uh the common criticisms are um he is like he obfuscates or is obscurantist in the way he talks and you're, and if you try to pin him down on something he's like no like, i'm not saying that you need to like and his fans do this a lot also they're like well have you like watched his 90 minute video on like the book of jeremiah like it's all laid out there um Duh, man yeah <laughs> so it's like you need to like absorb the whole canon of jordan peterson in order to like get a, just the inkling of the wisdom that the master <laughs> is presenting like this is total bullshit um the 12 the 12 rules for life i don't know some of them like make sense like sure <laughs> clean your room i made a joke on twitter that um you know it would the fact that um what's so shocking or revolutionary about jordan peterson saying clean your room is that mothers have been telling their sons to clean their rooms for generations but here's a man finally telling people to clean their room and so they'll they'll listen to him and then there actually was uh in that article that 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 kind of like mocking profile that the new york times did of him earlier this year they quoted someone from one of his events who was like yeah it took him saying clean your room for me to really understand that i had to clean my room it's like, okay, there's a lot of, I guess, young men out there who want, like, an older male authority figure to tell them what to do, even though a, well, lot, a lot of these things are, you know, not revolutionary ideas. You know, some of it is standard self-help book stuff, but, like, I guess the self-help genre is, like, coded female in a lot of ways, so... so yeah, like, I mean, Peterson obviously... Peterson is a manly man, a, and... He was filling a, a, a void. I mean, you know... It, speaking of non-revolutionary things to say, I mean, there are a lot of people out there who don't have adult male role models. I mean, there, yeah, there are a lot of mothers saying clean your room, but a lot of those guys don't have fathers. So I don't think, I mean, that's just true. Um, it may be a talking point of, of the right, uh, but that doesn't make it untrue in this case. So uh, he's definitely filling a niche. And, you know, to the extent that, you know, he he says he's been able to kind of catch people who would otherwise tilt over into the alt right. Um, you know, those those people in the basement who are angry at women and you know, kind of veering into incel life. Uh, if he's able to to catch those people and kind of bring them back um, into a more thoughtful kind of existence, great. I I, I actually think that's that's a fantastic thing. Um, I, I, it's, it's just, it's hard because any time you start talking about him, people just assume that you're advocating for him. And, you know, again, because we're in this moment where to speak of anything, uh, is to somehow be endorsing it. There's just this kind of, people are unable to kind of walk and chew gum at the same time or accept that somebody else is. So I, I don't think that, um, I, I don't think that the Peterson, you know, it's it's almost like we 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 talk we 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 talk about him too much, but but not in the right way. Um, you know, certainly the media coverage of him has been appalling. I mean, I have not seen such willful misconstrual, <laughs> frankly, here's, since the James Damore memo. I mean, if you want to get into that, that's like probably a whole other conversation. But it is in this realm of discussion. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't. I I think that there has just you know, with the exception of maybe David Brooks. 
Um, I, I don't think I have seen any kind of opinion piece that has granted Peterson any kind of due. Wesley Yang's profile in Esquire was excellent, I thought, um, and came as close to, you know, as, as, as good a profile as I've seen of a complicated figure um, of any sort um, in, in many years. So mm-hmm. I would encourage people to read that. Yeah, I actually, um, I wanted to get someone on a couple months ago who would give, you know, defend Peterson, and I emailed uh, Wesley Yang at the email on his, on his website, and he didn't reply. So Wesley Yang, if you're listening oh, to this, Wesley, <laughs> okay, still eager for you to come we'll on. Um, yeah, so I mean, the um, maybe the the like vehement uh, reaction from commenters and viewers that I've gotten when dissing Peterson makes sense if we think of him as like the father figure to young men who uh, lack a father figure for, for whatever reason, um, right. you know, they take it as a personal attack. Like this guy really, this guy really helped me and you're calling him. A well, Nazi it is religious. I mean, that's the scary thing about this. I mean, the religious overtones are alarming just as the religious overtones in a lot of the social justice world. It's are, like are he's doing alarming. tent revivals around the country yep. and he dresses like an yep. old timey preacher. Like, yeah, these, some of these things are, are strange and yeah but the the gospel except it is like you know uh the gospel of jordan peterson includes the bible and carl jung and ancient myths right look i would and rather the Dis- disney cartoons this. yeah i mean i would rather have this than than milo i mean <laughs> right well my, yeah well milo is is just a total like fraud huckster well, it's just like doing whatever he can to. Right, grab, but a lot of people buck. say you know use words like fraud and huckster with, with Peterson too, and I just I mean there's there's no comparison. I mean My, Milo is just profoundly uninteresting um, and just hollow in my view. Not funny either. Just not funny. And Peterson's even kind of funny, you know. <laughs> okay, I haven't I haven't heard I haven't I, I'll admit to everyone who you know out there who says you have to watch the video. I haven't watched the video. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I watch videos professionally, so I, I, I try to avoid this kind of stuff in my leisure hours. Um, yeah. So, uh, and I probably won't be watching his, you know, 22 series on the, 22 episode series on the book of Genesis. Um, sorry. <laughs> so, okay, well, here's maybe, we've talked a lot about this piece, um, and I wanted to discuss the other piece as well, but there's, I guess there's one more question I wanted to ask, which is like, how does uh, Donald Trump figure into all of this? Like, it, the timeline you described kind of moves along with, like Trump's emergence as a political figure, and then uh, obviously his uh, rise to the presidency. Like, how how did like Trump has polarized the conversation because he like polarizes everything. Like, you know, he polar he, he's he's managed to turn people against the NFL. Like people who probably love the NFL for generations now hate the NFL because right. you know, they're not kicking out the players who are kneeling during the national anthem. So, you know, that, that's like Trump's like one of Trump's superpowers is like polarization and tribalization. Um, right. So I can see how how Trump has pushed people on the left who you, you maybe five years ago would agree with mostly like even further because anything, you know, we have to get even further away from the like evil that is Trump. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things that's happened is, uh, um, you know, he has created a situation where a lot of people on the left just think that we think, you know, rightly in some ways that we are just in such a crisis that there is no room for these kinds of conversations. You know, I, I get a lot of like, well, why are you talking about these things now? We understand, you know, I I understand where you're coming from. I have similar feelings of, of conflictedness, but now is not the time we are in such uh, a terrible place. People are hurting so badly. There's so much harm being done uh, to people in marginalized groups, uh, you know, basically we're in a triage situation, uh, not now. And I think that is really dangerous. I, I think it should be, it's actually it should be completely the opposite. Uh, now is the time to start talking about things in an honest way. And now is the time for people on the left who can talk about them thoughtfully to do so. Because if, if smart people on the left don't start critiquing the left, stupid people are going to start critiquing the left and that's not going to help us. Um, So I think, you know, Trump has really brilliantly managed to shut the conversation down uh, among people who could really have a useful conversation. I mean, he has basically rendered everybody too afraid. He's, he's turned, you know, he's, he's, he's turned people, you know, the friends on friends. I mean, this is like, (laughs) That's kind of, it's, it's, he didn't engineer, it didn't come from his, you know, a conscious place, but, um, 
that that's what disturbs me really most of all. It's, you know, not the time. Yeah. Okay. Well. Yeah. What <laughs> saying that it, it didn't come from a conscious place made me think that of right. the uh, it's of the, the consciousness. <laughs> well, I was thinking of the Jungian unconscious. It is Trump some kind of like figure set here for us, like punish us for our sins. Well, um, that's a question for Jordan Peterson. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, so I guess I would just push back on that somewhat because, well, oh, first of all, I'll plug the Mindful Resistance newsletter, which is a uh, weekly newsletter. Uh, I get it. Yes. Put out by uh, Bob Wright, my boss, and I do some of the editing on it, and uh, some other people on staff here our contributors as well. And that's trying to uh, tamp down on the emotional reaction to Trump, look at everything with a mindful perspective and rationally and say like, what, you know, what are the things to pay attention to and what, what is like the circus that is just a distraction. Uh, And Trump is great at the circus. He's like better at it than anyone in the country. Um, So yeah, I guess I like, Oh, here's an alternate take. It's like, you know, this, this figure emerges who's like, kind of a who's like apolitical and he is like a charlatan <laughs> huckster um and he manages to win 45 percent of the popular vote and um becomes the president and he has no real affection for like due process or you know the way uh the government should properly function like all he cares about is himself and um and like getting on tv so <laughs> that's the, my central view of trump so how does you know so he like he has like an authoritarian temperament and like he would enjoy being a dictator but he's too stupid and incompetent plus, <laughs> to to actually try to do it plus all the ways that our american system of government would prevent him from doing that so he can't he's not going to become like the authoritarian dictator or anything like that no he's not really dictator material I, it, takes, it would take too much energy to be That's a dictator. Right. He would rather like you can't take you can't go golfing every weekend. Well, he has if you're no a dictator. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, and then at the same time, he's basically uh, most of what he's doing is basically what Marco Rubio or Ted Cruz would have done if they were president. The Supreme Court That's appointments right. are the same. Uh, big tax cut, trying to repeal Obamacare. You know, so like those things continue are continue on. Uh, but we have these new atrocities happening, like uh, imprisoning. Uh, migrant children who are arriving at the border without their parents and um you, you know the, the like daily insult to the dignity of the office and so on and so forth so there's all this stuff happening and then there's i feel like the people in the intellectual dark web have decided while well, all this like crazy stuff is happening and like maybe the country is under threat maybe it's not but like like there's definitely bad things happening it's like we're gonna talk about you know are men and women really biologically different what did a group <laughs> right. of 12 student protesters at Evergreen College do that was very bad, but like not truly of national concern, um, you know, pronoun stuff. <laughs> it's almost right. like, you know, they want to like ignore the Trump like madness, possible apocalypse, probably not apocalypse, but who knows. And instead focus on these like less, less important issues. Like we're not, we're, this is not like, you know, there's people on the left who feel like uh, we need, we're on like a war footing and we need to oppose Trump constantly and at all moments like i don't think that makes sense and certainly f- freaking out constantly about every like little revelation from the the Mueller investigation right. th- doesn't make any sense at all because like the average person has no effect over it um but like yeah this is this seems to me like <laughs> we're in the middle of uh, the worst political crisis since watergate or possibly worse than watergate and then we maybe yes. have to go back to uh the civil war or or, or something to find a, a comparable political p- crisis and like yeah this is the time like people who could be talking to conservative audiences who don't like Trump, like could be talking about like why, you know, voting for Trump was kind of a mistake. <laughs> we should, you shouldn't vote for him again instead of saying like SJWs, liberal tears, blah, blah, blah. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of talking about talking uh, in this group. I mean, I, 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 I would, I don't know. In my sort of more optimistic moments, I, I want to think, well, if we can kind of, if talking about talking helps us get to a place where we can talk in a, about things in a productive way, maybe then, you know, people in this sphere of conversation can start to talk about immigration policy. What does that mean? I mean, is, is, do we, do we even have one? What are American values? Where, how are we supposed to manage the situation? I mean, but you know, like I said before, we're just in a moment where to even say something like that, to even for, for you know, a, a person who identifies as on the left to say, 
what is our immigration policy? Do we need one? Yes, we do, because we are a country and every country has one. Uh, even it's so scary to even introduce those sorts of, of topics, you know, climate change, how, how far gone are we? What, you know, how can we separate, uh, the, you know, emotions from, uh, the facts, uh, how scary are those facts? Uh, regardless of how scary they are, what can we do to move forward? What can we do to save ourselves uh, to the extent possible. I, I feel like those are the sorts of subjects that need to be taken on, but um, maybe they can't be until we sort of figure out how to how to talk at all. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is very satisfying to beat up on social justice warriors. It is very satisfying to talk about snowflakes and trigger warnings. There is just a, a gut uh, a, a gut appeal in in you know beating up on those people. I, I certainly fall and pray to it myself, but it's, it's lazy. I mean, it's actually really, at the end of the day, it's not useful. It's obvious. Um, and it's just sort of like, um, uh, it's, it's like low hanging fruit. Yeah. Well, it's, it's preaching to the choir, um, which, yeah. which obviously both sides do. Um, and yeah. you know, a lot of the, <laughs> the main thing that people, liberals and people on the left talk about is Trump. And, you know, you could find 20 things <laughs> embarrassing that he does every day over which to celebrate uh, what a um, stupid moron he is. <laughs> um, so, yeah, both sides do this. And then there's definitely, um, especially on Twitter, there's a, um, depending on where you hang out, there's kind of like, yeah, this topic can't be broached. You can't talk about this. You can't, like, you know, if you don't support open borders, then, like, you're essentially, um, you know, putting up a, you know, the the uh, communists putting up the, the, the well, you're, uh, Berlin you're Wall or something. Right, I guess. I mean, everyone is alt-right. This is just the new thing to call anybody. I mean, I don't even know. Yeah, I don't like, I, I don't, what does that even mean? I don't, it's it's unclear. Yeah. Alt-right, Nazi, fascist. Just, just, yeah, I mean, the, uh, what's, I mean, what's uh, crazy about the past few years is it used to be like, you know, um, the, uh, like, you know, punks protesting in New York City in the 70s would yell at the cops fascist pig or something. It's like, oh, well, we found out in the past few years, oh, there actually are fascists and neo-Nazis and white supremacists, and they're kind of getting together because of the internet. And, um, you know, we and we know what happened at Charlottesville. Um, so that <laughs> made it so that the saying, like, oh, this guy's a fascist, um, the charge, which used to just be, like, hyper hyperbole, now it has, like, a ring of possible truth to it because... Um, right. You know, there are like active white supremacists who are uh, in the real world and online trying to achieve their objectives, and they have connections to the Republican Party. Um, some of them. So, okay, we've got a long time of this particular one. Is there anything else you want to say about uh, nuance of love story? <laughs> um, no, I think people. How long does it take to read? Eighteen minutes. What did they? What did they? I say? think it was twenty-eight minutes. Twenty minutes. If you've got if you've got twenty eight minutes, um, give me twenty eight minutes. I'll I'll give you the world. <laughs> That's a really dated reference. No, I I kind of remember that one too. Although maybe I just I just absorbed it from my parents. Ten ten wins. Yeah, ten ten wins. Did you grow up in the? You give us twenty two minutes. We'll give you yes. the world. Now the fact that they were even taking twenty two minutes to tell you the entire <laughs> news of the day. That's like an eternity now. That's a good point. Yeah. So this was the news. One of the news stations in um, coming out of New York City. Did you grow up in the greater New York area? Yeah, I did. I did mostly. Yeah. 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 I grew up in Northern New Jersey. So those were the, those are the stations we got. Okay. So, um, I'm happy to keep on talking about the other, <laughs> the other pieces. Um, but we have gone a while. Uh, do you want to, um, do you want to keep going or, or maybe. Uh, I can go for maybe like another f five, five minutes, 10 minutes or so. And then, uh, yeah. Okay. So. Well, why, why don't we skip the, um, uh, skip the me too piece. Uh, because that would probably require more than five minutes, and oh. and instead do the. Uh, I can summarize that. I mean, I whatever. Oh, you want to? Okay. Well, let's do, the, let's do the fuck okay. piece because that that could be five minutes. Um, so if that okay. So you wrote a piece, uh, why fuck is the word of the year? Um, <laughs> and I guess this was part of a piece that a series that Medium was doing about. You know, yeah, they just wanted. To, yeah, so they're asking different people to talk about the the words that mattered of, of the year. I, I mean, you know, fuck is really like the word of the of the era. Um, this has just always been a, a pet peeve of mine. If really this was just a good excuse to uh, kind of um, 
riff on on this. I, I just can't. I, you know, maybe it's because like I, I I'm I cut my teeth in in print journalism and like I was publishing before the digital age pretty much. And uh, you know, one thing you you learn as a professional is that you can't use certain words. And you know, I, I, in my newspaper column, I I used to have to say heck instead of hell like there's you know you wonder like why newspapers sound so corny and it's really because that you know there are standards and practices and and you cannot uh you know call yourself a badass and and say the f word uh every every other sentence so um yeah i do think it's almost become this like tick it's like it's like a way of signaling that that you are cool and edgy and you're kind of dangerous and and you're just gonna like you know drop you know, drop an f bomb into into everything and, and i see it like i know i sound like i'm clutching my pearls here and it's it's really not that i i i use it in casual conversation all the time, certainly too much. Uh, but I just think that there is this kind of um, tone that you see among media professionals and you see it on social media and, and people who, you know, in another time would have been comporting themselves with, with a certain kind of decorum and, um, you know, self-respect and respect for their readers, let's just say, who um, will just kind of happily uh, throw an F-bomb around to, to signal that they're actually kind of groovy and not old and fussy and writing for newspaper. And yeah, I think it's boring. Yeah. I just think it's lazy. Uh -huh. I think it's, it doesn't make you sound like a badass. It makes you sound like a lazy ass. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's interesting. I mean, it's, I, I believe there's a, there's a whole book about fuck that like talks about all the different um, oh, many definitions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's like the most versatile word in the language, maybe aside from like to. And be. it feels great to say just the consonants of it. The, you know, just it it rolls off the it doesn't even roll off the tongue. It like rolls off the <laughs> the mouth, the entire mouth. It's just it's very it's just very. Um, yeah, and as it's, has been noted, exactly. it, it can like be any part. It can be like a noun, a verb, an adjective, an adverb, yes. <laughs> and an injunction, a, a imperative voice. Um, so yes. yeah, it's it's but the kind of the mainstreaming of it, I think like. The, in the past year or so, I, a couple like senators or Congress people have tweeted "fuck." I feel I, I don't want to name any names <laughs> because I'm going to get it wrong. But yeah, it's it's getting more mainstream. Uh, to, as, well, as you are you are to the point of you know cliche. Um, I don't know. I mean, when it was said less in public, did it have more of a charge when you heard it in? private i have no, i have no idea i think it you know it still obviously has some kind of a charge because i don't think you could say it on primetime tv you could have printed it in the pages of the new york times um but maybe that's just like old yeah old funny duddiness um where yeah i mean i you know because when robert de niro was it at the at the tonys yes. he got up and he yelled you know he's <laughs> it's like i have something very important to say <laughs> fuck trump <laughs> and i guess they did bleep it uh on the network feeds, but everybody knew what he was saying. And it's like, that's all you got. <laughs> yeah. It's... And, and, you know, but everybody, you know, they, they rise to their feet and what a powerful moment and what a brave, what a brave member of the resistance. Well, and I just... yeah, I, I was thinking, I mean, all roads lead back to Trump. So Trump is like a crude figure. And, you know, encourages crudeness in others. Um, in the way, you know, uh, uh, Shakespeare has Falstaff saying he is witty and inspires wit in others. Uh, Trump is crude and inspires crudeness in others. Um, and, you know, the way I, I, I make Trump jokes on Twitter uh, the way many hundreds of thousands of other pe people do. And I just have no, like, compunction about, like, treating him as, like, the, like a slug, basically. And you know, talking about how he's a fat fucking moron or whatever. Like, I don't think I wouldn't have talked like that about George W. Bush, even though his policies were equally loathsome. It's just that to me, Trump is such an awful, awful person, like in, in, in all ways possible, uh, private and public. And yeah, he, he like, like, yeah, fuck Trump. He fucking sucks. Like, we need to get that fucking guy out of here. And then we'll spend like years trying to clean up the mess that he made. Uh, but yeah. Uh, Trump fucking sucks. I don't know. It's, uh, I'm, I'm yeah. exaggerating a little bit, but that kind of is how I feel. Like <laughs> yeah. he does fucking suck. I was, look, I mean, this is not a uh, particularly uh, hard hitting piece of journalism. <laughs> I just um, I wanted to something. You know, it's like if what if what if, what if Red Butler had said to Scarlett O'Hara, "Frankly, my dear, I don't give a fuck." <laughs> like 
Maybe we would have just gotten out of our system a long time ago. And well, I think it was kind of scandalous that he said "damn" in that, yeah, in that era. That's right. But and we have this hierarchy for you know, for some some reason that maybe Jordan Peterson can tell us about why certain certain curse words are considered like verboten. Um, I, I, you know, the the um, Samantha B calling was it Ivanka? I, a cunt like oh, that would, yeah that was another like that's many... yeah that's a third you can't cross over into see you next tuesday land <laughs> right so that, that that's the that seems to be the only word that still has any sort of like taboo attached to it and of course like uh racial or ethnic slurs i guess um right yeah i just i don't know i kind of i i i was really i mean this again i this is a, probably another conversation but i i was i i still have faith in the when they go low, we go high uh, model. I, I was I, I was sorry to see that um, abandoned. You know, Michelle Obama said that. And, and I, I, I understand why it was abandoned, of course, because we are in a moment of such acute crisis that we don't have the luxury of, of going high. But I wonder how many people there are out there who really, it's not that they like Trump, they just hate, hate us. And if we presented a, you know, a, a more appealing sort of model for behaving and, and resisting and thinking things through. Maybe we'd catch a few of those people, but I'm probably naive there. Yeah. I don't know if I would agree with that. I, I, you know, when, when Michelle Obama said that, I was like, yeah, that sounds good to me. It's a nice line, but I mean, Trump went low and he won. Uh, does that mean the Democrats should go low? I, I'm not, I don't know about that. Right. I go back and forth and you see people like Avenatti and some other people trying to position themselves as like the Trump of the left. Um, it doesn't seem like that style will work as well with um, like the Democratic uh, primary. But the Obamas never went low. The Obamas were always so high. I mean, they were just magnificent at, at maintaining a, a level of of decorum. I mean, just no missteps. And, and I, I think, I think that's why he won. I mean, I think he really, really impressed people, um, and brought people in, but anyway, we're getting, <laughs> yeah, we're getting, we're getting away from fuck, but it does, it does seem like, um, I, I think I would bet it'd be, uh, the Democrats would, would be smarter to pick a anti-Trump rather than a like mirror Trump. Um, you know, someone of, uh, someone who was essentially normal, like, you know, return to normalcy as that, like, post-World War I um, campaign slogan went. Like, I think people are getting very tired of the circus, and it's going to be two more years of it if Trump stays in office. And then someone is just like, yeah, let's just go back to, like, you don't really need to think about the president every single day of your life. Like, <laughs> that, that, wouldn't that be a relief? And just, like, a normal, boring person? Like, I think that's a winning, <laughs> winning message. <laughs> normal, boring in 2020. That could be somebody's <laughs> campaign. You know, like, I, I already I, forgot. <laughs> I vote for me because you're gonna <laughs> immediately forget about me. Yeah, like like George H. W. Bush, you know, kind of just like a not not super exciting guy who you know will kind of just like do something, do stuff, and you're not gonna have to right. be constantly worried about it. Um, okay, uh, sure. people, were, people were pretty worried about it about him back in the day. It's easy to forget, but yeah, yeah. I guess that's yeah, that's true, and it's always like there's there's like a running joke on Twitter that in like ten years people will be like. Oh, remember the good days of Donald Trump before we had president like Diamond and Silk or <laughs> whoever it's going to be. Um, uh, the the sense of decorum we had back then. Um, okay, so uh. we've, <laughs> we've got on uh, a while, not as long as Joe Rogan goes, but mm. um, but fairly long for blogging heads. Um, so okay, so where can so people can find? We're going to link to the pieces we mentioned on Medium. Uh, where else can people find your work? Um, well, uh, you can go, you can follow me on Twitter. Um, it's, uh, at Megan with an H M E G H A N underscore down D A U M. Um, I'm going to be writing, uh, more for medium in the coming year. And, um, yeah, you, I have a, you can follow me on Facebook, on Twitter, I post everything there. I have several books. Just Google me and you'll find out more than you wanted to know. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you, thank you for coming on. I don't know if it was as good as when Courtney Cox got pulled up on stage to dance with Bruce Springsteen. Well, <laughs> that didn't go on for an hour and a half. So. <laughs> yeah, this is more like Max. This is more like Max Weinberg um, pulling pulling you on the stage. Um, <laughs> who actually went to my high school? Um, one of the proud alumni of my high school. Um, oh. but that's that's neither here nor there. Um, so thank you uh, so much, Megan, uh, for coming on uh, and taking the time. Okay. Um, thank you to all of our viewers 
and listeners, and we'll see you again next time. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>